So how long are we going to study this morning? Do the talk and then we yeah, then have the conversation. Yeah, it's the same for five minutes. Okay. okay. Sounds good. I think that you don't need. Oh, you need. You have your card. Oh, you yes, your card. Sorry. It's just a minute. Some matching. Especially when I have papers and things. Nobody needs to see it. I'll be there. I'll change it. Sorry. 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 So let's continue Sorry. our okay. lectures Very good. to you. Okay, is it this is on or are we on a video again? Yes, okay. you are a superstar. Exciting. <laughs> All right, so good morning. Good morning for whoever is on the video. Good night, good morning so far. Um, so we're gonna, I think, completely switch gears, right? And talk about something very different than we've talked about so far. Um, we'll talk about oral dysesthesia, um, the term I usually like to use, um, versus calling the condition burning mouth syndrome. Burning mouth syndrome, it's, it's so specific. Um, and oftentimes patients we're treating don't actually report burning as their primary symptom. So. Whenever I'm explaining to patients, I always use this term sort of to educate them. Um, and I think there's very few patients that you see who will know what the term dysesthesia is. I had no idea what the term dysesthesia was when I started dental school. I don't know if everybody here did. Um, but I think most people, everybody knows anesthesia. Everybody knows, most people understand paresthesia. And then they tend to understand as you sort of go through that progression and explain some of the features. Um, this talk is not entirely focused on clonazepam, and a little bit like we were talking about laser photobiomodulation for certain conditions. Um, there's certainly not one treatment that's more effective, less effective, the only treatment that's going to be effective for this condition. And as we'll talk a little bit, and I'm by no means an expert on placebo science, but I find it incredibly interesting. And I think for all the conditions that we treat within the scope of oral medicine, this condition, oral dysesthesia, probably lends itself much more to anything else, to being susceptible to a placebo response, and actually in a very good way, something that we can potentially harness, um, something that I talk about honestly with patients, um, versus starting a patient who has chronic graft-versus-host disease or lichen planus, they have painful oral lesions. You know exactly what they are, why they have them, and you treat with a topical steroid. I don't think that there's a huge potential for the placebo response, um, but that's our bias, and there absolutely is some potential for placebo response, um, and maybe even some potential for placebo response that leads to some physiologic change, um, because again, there's a lot we don't understand about the body. Um, but. The reason I'm making that introduction is I don't want the takeaway from this talk to be, you know, we treat oral dysesthesia with clonazepam, but it is something that I do use maybe a little bit more than some of my colleagues at my center, just because we all have our own sort of personal preferences, um, things that we think are better, worse, more appropriate, maybe a better sort of ladder type step approach um, versus starting with one treatment over another. Um, but I think from the standpoint of thinking about evidence base, which I know is something we're trying to incorporate into, the, um, into these talks while I'm here, that it's probably the, the best story to tell. Um, 
with respect to there being an evidence base, even from the like more basic elements of why we would even use the treatment, let alone does it work. So we'll talk a little bit about just what is oral dysesthesia. Um, we'll talk a little bit about mechanisms for sort of how and why uh, clonazepam, or I guess any drug in that class, would be effective in managing the condition. And then we'll look at some of the data science that supports the use specifically of topical clonazepam, something that um, you know, we've had quite a bit of experience with over a number of years now. And, um, and just looking at the science behind it and what we understand and what we don't understand. I find this topic really interesting. We were talking about patients we like to see, patients we don't like to see. Um, honestly, even if I had a full day of only chronic graft versus host disease, which is a condition that you know I have a reputation somewhat based on, I love seeing these patients. Um, if I saw that's all I saw every day, five days a week in the clinic, it would get really boring. And you'd start thinking like, okay, well, when am I gonna get the next patient that develops a cancer or something like that? And you don't wanna be thinking like that. You just wanna like love treating the condition for what it is. So I like the variety. Like we were talking about, sometimes I have a chronic graphosis disease patient, and then they develop the dysesthesia. Makes them more interesting. So, okay, now I have a different patient in my oncology clinic. Um, on the flip side, again, I couldn't see oral dysesthesia patients all day, five days a week. I don't think I can do it all day, even one day a week. But within, you know, an oral medicine clinic, in the morning or the afternoon, I have eight to 10 patients. Two or three of them have dysesthesia. Great, maybe one, maybe two of them are new patients. I can handle that. One of them's a follow-up. Maybe they're on an annual follow-up. They're doing really well. These are, they're really fun patients to manage. So, it's the last time I'm going to forget to advance because I went through learning objectives and you couldn't see what I was saying. And now I'm, I'm caught up with the same slide. So how do we define burning mouth syndrome, the term that's, that's typically used to describe this condition within the um, pain classification systems? Described as Um, an intraoral burning or dysesthetic sensation recurring daily for more than two hours per day for more than three months without evident causative lesions on clinical examination and investigation. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the more than two hours a day and for more than three months, I'm not entirely certain exactly what the basis is for that, and I would argue that it's actually probably, it's actually quite rare that somebody would have daily symptoms that are less than two hours a day with this diagnosis. But there are patients who do have the sort of what's referred to as type three burning mouth syndrome, where you have days that on and off. So to argue that those patients don't qualify for this diagnosis, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with. Um, but diagnostic criteria specifically, uh, there's oral pain and then fulfilling these, these criteria below, the recurring daily for at least two hours, greater than three months. Um, pain has the, the following characteristics, has a burning quality, and really important, it's felt superficially. So I don't know how much pain you all see, you know, in your practice or in your training, but if you see two patients in a row, both patients are describing burning pain, both patients are describing burning pain of the anterior maxilla, let's say. Common site for symptoms in a patient with burning mouth or oral dysesthesia, regardless of whether they have tongue and tip burning or not. Um, and you have a patient who has sort of a, a typical dysesthesia. You have a patient who has what would more qualify as what we used to call atypical facial pain, or atypical odontalgia, or persistent uh, idiopathic facial pain. They'll describe a similar sensation, but it may also have like a deeper ache to it. Like a, it's a much deeper kind of pain. And it won't feel like it's on the surface. Like they'll describe it as if it's in like deep in the bone. In patients with dysesthesia, they, they almost never describe that. So, so it is different, and I think that's an important criteria. It's not like 
my the center of my tongue burns and it's going to the outside and it's like crisping. It's like just it's just the outside that burns. Which is why I think that they have other symptoms that if it's not burning, it could be something else, like the coated sensation or even the swollen sensation. It just has something to do with, you know, an altered sensation of what the, the outside feels like. Um, oral mucosa D is uh, normal appearing. You obviously excluded any local or systemic causes. Um, there are certainly conditions, and I'll just stop on D for a second. There are certainly conditions where a patient can have either a local or systemic um, underlying cause for a condition where a patient would say, my tongue burns. I don't disagree with that. But I do not like the designation of primary versus secondary burning mouth. I don't, I don't remember if I'm going to talk about that today. There's no such thing as secondary burning mouth syndrome. It doesn't exist. I mean, a secondary means that it's another diagnosis. But if it's another diagnosis, there's no such thing as secondary like in plantus. There's no such thing as secondary chronic heart versus host disease. There's not, even the way we use secondary in Canada, it's, 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 it's sort of an expected side effect of the treatment. Um, so you either have a diagnosis or you don't have a diagnosis, I would argue. And um, I don't know of any condition. I don't want to say any because again, you have your sort of extremes. There are there is some subset of patients who have what appears to be a sort of variant of burning mouth syndrome, where they have minimal of any symptoms of rest, and their mouths are very sensitive with some sort of stimulation, like you would expect with a patient, for example, with lichen planus. Um, but they're the exception, not the and I would argue, yes, there's other patients that may present with symptoms like that. You really need to differentiate, like, is, you know, is this actually what we're dealing with? Um, but a patient who has, for example, erythematous candidiasis, their mouth burns, and it's really sensitive when they eat, if you want to argue that a patient with oral dysesthesia could have the same symptoms, I won't say you're wrong, but I'd say that if you want to take your whole bucket of oral dysesthesia patients, take 100 of those patients, you're going to have maybe one or less that's like the patient that has an erythematous candidiasis. So even having to differentiate sort of local and systemic causes, it's usually not that difficult because it's such a unique diagnosis in the way that patients present. You hear the story and, you know, you take a history for a patient with oral dysesthesia. When you do the exam and you actually see something, it really surprises you. And you take a step back and you realize, okay, this is why I always get a really good exam. And, I mean, why I get a really good history and why I do a very thorough exam. Because occasionally you get a really full history and, and you're thinking, this patient must have oral dysesthesia. You examine them and they have, you know, like implants throughout the mouth. So, um, and then there's a few comments um, noted. It's typically bilateral, but it can be unilateral. Um, symptoms can fluctuate, so it's like any condition, it's not going to be stable all the time. Um, tip of the tongue is the most common site, which I think is important to point out. You know, it's not always the tongue, you know, especially about the women tongue. It's not always just the tip, but by far the most common site. And other dysesthesias are common, and I think this is one of the most common, com most, most important comments here. Um, of course, based on this criteria, you would not well, a patient would not qualify for this diagnosis without having the burning pain. And I would argue that these other dysesthesias fulfill the criteria just as uh, importantly as burning, even if they're not as common or as common to be the only symptom that a patient presents with. But dry mouth or xerostomia, incredibly common. The patient has a very wet mouth. Um, altered taste. Um, uh, <clears throat> usually, a, usually like a persistent fantagusia. So it's it's some patients may report like just an alteration when they go to eat something, um, but in most cases it's, it's like the burning. It's like a, a switch got turned on, um, and it's the same thing with the taste. You know, it's usually like a bitter or metallic taste, um, sometimes just sort of a really bad taste. Um, swelling is a common sensation, a coated sensation. Um, 
those are the most common. I think almost anything else that someone describes, usually you can kind of push it into one of those categories. Um, psychosocial comorbidities, so anxiety, depression, other psychiatric conditions are um, very common, but not necessary to be associated with this diagnosis. And at least, at least from a clinical epidemiology standpoint, because we always have to be careful, we don't actually do population-based studies, right? I don't know why somebody comes to my clinic, why they get referred to my clinic, um, but we know from you know years of literature and experience that there's at least a preponderance, meaning you know, maybe towards the majority of patients we see, but not all of the patients, and certainly not defining the patient population um, of women versus men, and men male patients, and women who are very or postmenopausal. Um, but again, I have many male patients, and I've seen female patients as young as 14, 15 with this condition. So it's, you know, it's, not, it's not something that's specific to menopause. So these are all, whoops, these are all patients with oral dysesthesia. I'm sure you can all describe the features really well, right, in each one, a lot of detail. I will say that the patient on the far right of the screen um, had symptoms on the soft palate. When they came to see me, they described excoriations, like like you know, like big open like cuts that must be causing the symptoms, and it's just the vasculature. So but you know these patients all study themselves, so I wouldn't be surprised if the patient here who had burning mouth had said, you know, and this blue thing, you know, this little, you know, this little venule is, is really uncomfortable. So I don't know that I can explain exactly the how and why of where these symptoms come from, but I think it's at least nice to kind of think anatomically. Um, you know, ultimately, everything that's being felt, you're listening to me right now, you're seeing, right? We, it's all in our brain. We have a central and we have a peripheral nervous system, and the, the connections as you all know, and some of you here have studied this more frequently and probably in more detail than I have recently, um, it's incredibly, incredibly complex. Um, we understand, you know, the, the overall innervation, innervation patterns, why we have certain types of senses in the mouth and in the tongue. But it's actually really difficult to explain sort of from a, like a functional anatomical standpoint, how and why oral dysesthesia develops. Like what is, what, what actually is mediating it? Why does it have, you know, such site specificity? Why do, why do certain things modulate it so effectively? Um, I don't have answers for it, but I think, you know, if you're interested in this, you're seeing patients, they're gonna ask you questions um, you want to be able to have some sort of a discussion with them. I, I don't keep, you know, diagrams in my in my office, but I do explain, you know, some some of these basic concepts, um, and I think it helps. You know, patients patients appreciate a little bit of information. So, what about etiologic factors? You know, we know that there's certain um, factors that are at least associated. And there have been a number of studies that have shown, I think, some, some pretty important factors. So these are, these are a couple of, let's just say, somewhat older um, studies and references. In um, the, the paper on the left, looking at causative or precipitating aspects of burning mouth syndrome case control study, um, they had, um, as you can see, 61 patients. 54 controls, so actually really good size. Um, I know you have many patients here to do studies. We do as, we do as well. Um, but just the time and effort that it takes to actually enroll, see, collect data, you know, on that many patients, it's it's a it's a big undertaking. Um, and they went 
you know, they underwent all these different evaluations, including um, sal salivary flow rates, which is great because obviously a lot of these patients will describe dry mouth. Um, various lab tests, all the types of lab tests that you read about and or see and recommended um, for patients with oral dysesthesia. Um, unless, again, unless I'm ruling something out specifically, there's no tests that I'm typically going to order unless there's something really unique about the patient's medical history. Like, I'm not trying to determine is this patient an undiagnosed diabetic unless there's some other aspect of my review of systems that's pointed in that direction. Maybe if you know that they're a poorly controlled diabetic and they haven't seen a doctor in a long time, that there's a perfect rationale for you to do some testing. But I wouldn't do that kind of testing on any sort of regular basis. Of course, this was a study, so they did, um, they did the routine testing. They also uh, tested for candida, um, looked at various parafunctional activities, and um, looked at anxiety, anxiety and depression using uh, validated scales. And they didn't find that there were any statistically significant differences with regard to any of the variables except for anxiety and depression. So, um, and again, I would say that from a clinical management standpoint, I'm probably not the one to be screening a patient for anxiety or depression, but it's also, you know, again, I don't know because we, there's no way for us to, to know for sure, but um, I think that most of our patients already have a diagnosis, and they're actually already aware of that diagnosis. Um, there may be some patients that are undiagnosed. We could play some role in helping them sort of move towards a diagnosis. Maybe we could do that better. Um, but I don't think there's that many of those patients. I mean, most of these patients are actually seeking, you know, seeking that type of, of that type of help. Um, and then the, this other study, um, usefulness of the um, HAD. So. Um, hospital anxiety and depression scale, the same one that was used in the Italian study, um, in assessing anxiety and depression in patients with burning mouth. And they also note the study confirmed that the two most common aspects of neurosis seen in hospital practice, anxiety and depression, are involved in the etiology of burning mouth syndrome. It's important that treatment of persons with psychogenic aspects to their burning mouth syndrome should include a psychological input as well as a biologic one. I love the quote, but I mean, if Anybody here who treats burning mouth syndrome, you know, most of what we're doing is psychological counseling, even though we don't actually have any formal training in it. So I think we actually get very good at it. Um, I don't know that I can take my counseling skills outside of the context of being in the oral medicine clinic, but I'm sure it has made me a better person in some ways, just diagnosing and managing and following these patients year over year because um, it's just a totally different experience. And you have to read each patient differently, speak with each patient differently. Um, and so much of them getting better is about how we interact with them. So I really stress that now before we even talk about any other evidence base. You can have the best treatment in the world for these patients, but if you don't explain it well, they don't trust you, they don't actually believe you about their diagnosis, um, it's not going to work. And then these are just a couple of interesting references. You know, when I started putting this talk together for, um, I'm trying to remember. So I put this talk together for last November, um, at least, you know, the basis of this talk for my visit at USB, but I think before that, or around that time, it may have been when we started doing, a, we, when we do a lot of teaching with our residents, but then our residents sometimes ask for more teaching. So um, we, initially, we instituted a new course that we called Oral Medicine Immersion, and each faculty member has a certain number of like, you know, teaching sessions with the residents, and we can basically do whatever we want. So, I recognize that um, when I was program director, I would put a lot of emphasis on really sort of making sure that we had a good basis of, um, of you know, the, of the sort of important historic literature for certain conditions, diagnoses. Um, and I think that that literature has continued to be incorporated into some of the teaching, but sometimes it doesn't get emphasized as much. So I figured, 
will be fun for me. And our residents, it's a three-year program, so we do, sometimes we schedule certain things, so it's, it's almost like more than a two or three-year rotation of, of teaching, would be to start really like putting together nice collections of literature um, for certain conditions. And I think that I did this one prior to um, putting the talks together. So it's kind of fun to like, okay, well, what papers do I think are really, really critical and everyone's going to read? Um, and the talk I gave the other day on interlesional steroid therapy, I sort of did the other way around because that was a talk that my colleagues in Indonesia asked me to give. I had to put everything together, and then once I put it together, I was like, I never read any of this when I was in training. And it's so interesting. So then I turned that into actually a three session um, oral medicine version because we went through all the papers, <laughs> not just the ones that you selected for that day. Um, so these are, uh, these are just interesting papers. And um, again, when I'm trying to work off the screen, I'm, I'm going to struggle to, to try, and, try and read anything off of here. But these are, these are two. Um, this is a paper, one from 1970. The other one is from, I don't know if I can read. They're both around this, they're from this era. And they describe some really um, kind of interesting and sometimes crazy interpretations of what is burning mouth and what treatments, this is coming in from like dental journals, and what treatments should be considered in a patient who is presenting with these symptoms. And I'll see if there's anything I can pull out of here. It may be more fun that you just take a picture, and, or I can, if I didn't provide you with these, I send them. Again, I'm not saying there's something to learn from this, but I think it's important to understand like, where has our, you know, where has our field been? What do people understand today? What do people still think? Um, yeah, very interesting. But I mean, this one on the right side is, and I'm, and I'm not going to say that everything is crazy because some of the potential solutions that the, that the dentists have can act as good placebos potentially. But you know, the, the actual sort of rationale behind is, is very interesting to read. And then again, this was a couple of, um, couple of interesting papers that I found in just trying to think about, like, you know, sometimes you want to teach a point, make a point. Um, it's nice to see, like, what have others done, written about, published, that maybe speaks to what I'm trying to get across, but not specifically about that situation or condition, if that makes sense. So I figured, as I was doing this work, and accepting more and more how fascinating and complicated this unique condition is that we see in oral medicine. I just took a step back and I said, there must be some good papers that talk about the nervous system and how complex of a system it is. And these were a couple of interesting papers I found in the process. So one of them is literally called Complexity of the Nervous System. Um, and then there's this really, uh, this really cool uh, figure on this right side. So the title of the figure is Overview of the Behavioral Loop and Stages at Which Noise is Present in the Nervous System. Because you think about somebody who has oral dysesthesia, to some extent it's a noise problem. And the fact that in most cases, simply eating, chewing, stimulating the mouth, can totally turn off symptoms, tells you that it's not even that noisy, probably. So it's like a little bit of something somehow becomes this like really, really bothersome symptom. Um, and I can't go through and explain this figure nearly as well as the authors, I'm sure. But just visually, if you look at it and think about it, you realize like there are so many places in which something it gets a little bit off, or you know, the, the game of telephone, you know, we have that term in, in Portuguese, like when kids play telephone, you start with one phrase, by the time it goes around the room, it's like, what are you talking about? It's not even like, 
It's a different language at this point, right? That's what the nervous system is, I think, is like when something gets off. And then pain, right? Pain is its own, right? Because these patients come to us, let's just call dysesthesia pain. You know, I explained, like, a dysesthesia, it's uncomfortable. It could be a tickle, it's uncomfortable. It could be, my mouth always tastes like strawberry, but that's a dysesthesia. It's like, it shouldn't be tasting like strawberry. You don't want to always taste like strawberry. But just using the term pain, and I don't know if any of you have seen this type of diagram before, you know, what are all the different sort of aspects of the patient that ultimately contribute to the symptom of pain? And these are the different aspects of more important, less important, you know, down to physical health, you know, psychological background, quality of life, um, and so on. But I mean, all these different domains, um, biochemical, nociceptive, you know, just tissue injuries, history of this, um, lifestyle. Pain is really complicated. So imagine every single patient you see, if this is, let's just say that was me, I don't know, and it's a different amount of, you know, heat map colors. And Science loves these types of di diagrams now, right? You get the right program, you put a few things in. But imagine that each one of us has a different profile. Let's say each of us has the exact same pain symptom. I don't know. All of us in a row had to, I don't know, have a nail torn off. So we could experience what it's like to experience a little bit of torture. Each of us is going to experience it differently. We're going to anticipate the event differently. Because maybe somebody's experienced it once, maybe somebody's had trauma in their life. You know, all these things are going to mean that, like, yeah, we all have pain, but it's a different, um, it's a different puzzle. What about the role of the peripheral versus the central nervous system? So I think this is obviously a really interesting and important question because we can use certain medications, potentially systemically, we can use certain medications um, topically. And for any of this evidence base we have in oral dysesthesia, I mean, most of these are, are single, single center studies, right? Most of these are single studies. So we take something from each of these, but also we don't know how well they can be replicated. I haven't tried to replicate them. Um, but you know, the study on, um, on, the, on the left of the screen, the effects of topical anesthesia and oral burning. So they tested the effect of applying topical anesthetic on uh, patients' intensity ratings for oral burning. Um, taste dyskusia and tested um, a couple of different tastes. We had 33 patients, um, and anesthetic reduced the perceptual intensity of, um, of, I think, pain, and also in some cases of the um, of the taste. And let's see what do they say here. So ultimately, they suggest that this condition is at least in part, for some patients, peripherally mediated. Because, you know, all these studies, you get some variable outcomes. Um, similarly, on um, the right side is actually giving a lingual nerve block and um, seeing, you know, if you block the nerve peripherally, does that actually make the pain go away? Um, and they studied, you know, using a number of different measures. Um, Sorry. Sorry. No, I said, nope. when I slow down, this because I'm trying to read, and I'm used to a bigger screen, even <laughs> for presenting. Sorry. No, no, no. Um, give me, let me just catch the, so they, um, so this is randomized double blind crossover, looking at ner lingual nerve block on the effect of patients with spontaneous um, on oral dysesthesia burning. And they want to correlate potentially with the effects of topical clonazepam, um, how the patient responds to psychological questionnaire, and uh, taste and both taste and heat thresholds. So testing um, nerve perception, and they and then they you know they measured these in a number of different ways. 
Um, and they were able to identify two groups of patients, essentially a group that had sort of peripheral responses, um, and another group that was really a central group where they actually in some cases had increase in pain, even with blocking the nerve, which didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, topical clonazepam tended to be more effective in the peripheral than the central patients, but it wasn't universal. And it's to me, that's actually the most important takeaway from this paper, because what it tells me is you can protect, let's just say, so I've had this discussion with Alan and others. Um, they've been interested in, in even doing a study of lingual nerve block. I've told him, I don't know if he's on, I, I think you're crazy to do it. Anybody who sees burning mouth patients on a regular basis, I think you're crazy if at your first visit, you're going to stick a needle in their tongue. Like, you want to cause a problem, you want their symptoms to get worse, you want something so that you don't see this patient again and now they've gone somewhere else and you know their ear burns also and it's like, why did you refer me to this? I, I don't, I, I'm sure most patients can tolerate the nerve block fine. And I'm sure again, because we talked about placebo science, if you know they come in, they're comfortable, they're happy to see you, they're coming to you know the best of the best in Brazil or the best of the best in the United States, and you explain this is a routine process of the workup. No, I don't think that most patients will have an adverse effect from it, but I do think that even in that setting, you will have adverse events, and I don't see the value in doing this testing because if you do that testing and you use it to make a decision, your decision would be, based on the test, I will really use a systemic or a topical agent. But they've shown that it's actually not totally reliable. So I take a more pragmatic approach in general to medicine, as long as I don't feel like I'm taking a great risk, which is maybe this one's just easier to begin with. Maybe this one's just less expensive to begin with. Maybe this one is less likely to cause side effects to begin with. And maybe, despite what this study has shown us, I also look at the placebo studies and I say, okay, well, there's some truth to this. There's some truth to the placebo side of things. Um, let's just start with this. And, you know, I only have so many options. So I don't need the testing to open a new door. The testing is just helping me sort of be a little bit more efficient in your decision making. So it's an inexpensive test. And then this is all some really interesting um, data. Again, nothing that I'm an expert on, but you know, start trying to think about you know, how or why would a treatment work? Um, how or why would it work centrally versus peripherally? And here are a few studies that, again, any of you who are interested, maybe interested in doing research in this area, you can pull these papers, um, look for new papers. But um, first, first paper on the upper left, first paper on the left side is um, titled, Is There a Role for GABA in Peripheral Taste Processing? And of course, they believe that there is. So it's not just talking about you know, burning and sensation, but talking about taste, very interesting. Um, paper in the middle talking about peripheral GABA receptor activation um, in rat tongue around mechanical sensitivity. So again, it shows that you know, these receptors that we can target are not only present in the mouth peripherally, in the mucosa, but they do something, which of course they do something. You know, everything does something. We, don't, we have all this uncoded DNA. It's, of course, it's not worth it. It does. It probably is just as important as the coded DNA. We just don't really understand what most of it does. Uh, <clears throat> and then the one on the right, GABA, its receptors, and GABAergic inhibition in mouse taste buds. So again, more sort of you know actual basic science data demonstrating the presence of something and the fact that um, it you know. It These are some um, these are some figures from um, 
from these papers. They're just showing sort of the presence of these GABA receptors um, and proposing sort of potential sort of mechanisms based on location and position. Um, you know, at this point, this gets a little bit outside of my area of expertise. So if you have questions, I can try and answer afterwards. But I would, I would argue, if you're interested in this, just you know, pull these papers. Look at PubMed, like what other papers does it, you know, like similar papers, like, oh, maybe I'll look at this one and this one, and you can learn a lot very quickly. So, you know, I'm not here to convince you that any treatment is better than another treatment, but again, from an evidence-based standpoint, I like the way the story sort of comes together, where now at this point, I think from what we've talked about, it's reasonable to, to look at what about the role of clonazepam. So um, this was probably the, the first most important study um, that really sort of put clonazepam for oral dysesthesia um, on the map, at least in the oral medicine world. This was um, published by Marion Brushka in 1998. So you know, I graduated dental school in 2000, and this was like hot off the press as a dental student. Wow, you know, open label, um, dose escalation, pilot study, effective clonazepam, clinical mouse syndrome, really nicely designed, executed study, Mary Grishka, Joel Epstein, and others. Um, and they found that, and again, this, this is, again, maybe we can go to this, this screen and look the other way, um, but found that um, in as much as 70% of patients, having significant pain reduction with use of um, clonazepam. And they know that double-blind placebo-controlled trials are warranted. They're just trying to see what they say about um, toxicity, drowsiness, but lower in the lower dose, which is not surprising. Um, yeah, so as, as far as classic literature goes, and again, for any of you who are interested or just for all of you who are training in the field, I'd say if you're not familiar with this paper, you, sort of, you have to read it. Um, so anything else I want to tell you from these, from these tables as I let my eyes adjust? Okay, Chuck, but, if you want to, can you like this? On the screen? Uh, no, no, that's okay. In the, in the text. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's okay. So, in um, also in 1998, we had this first report. Um, the title is "A Possible Therapeutic Solution for Stomatidinia or Mouse Syndrome," and this was looking at the potential topical use of clonazepam. So they had um, mostly female, but some male patients, um, all with oral dysesthesia. And they were instructed to suck on either 0 0.5 um, or 1.0 milligram tablet of clonazepam. And they were asked to keep it in the mouth for three minutes, sucking on it, letting their saliva accumulate, and then sort of swishing it around, but not swallowing it and doing that twice a day or up to three times a day. Um, and they kind of gave them, you know, depending on how they were, how they were responding, tolerant, they could go to three times a day, but not more. They tested um, a visual analog scale, a baseline four weeks after. Um, and then follow up after that of anywhere from three to 29 months. Um, they checked blood levels in 12 patients, not all patients. They did that one and three hours after um, dosing, and uh, they had three of 12 of those patients totally undetectable. So three patients did have detectable levels, um, but the levels were very low compared to the therapeutic range. And um, there was a relatively rapid onset of three to five hours um, uh, of effect. Some patients did require going to the higher dose to have the effect, and the response was variable. Um, no systemic adverse events were reported, which is interesting. Um, 
So this is the paper from 1998. And then in uh, 2004, six years later, again in the middle of my training, so this is an exciting time, but, you know, where I'm seeing all these patients and we're staying on top of the literature and there's, <clears throat> and I think Milo can, Milo and Marco can attest to this also that um, when we were training and or early in our practice in oral medicine, it was a lot easier to keep up with the literature. Yeah. There were, you know, for every, for every, um, I don't know, 100 papers published right now, just going back to the early 2000s, from 100, it would have been like 10 papers, maybe. It's just, it's just exploded. The number of journals, the number of just work being published. Not necessarily all good work, not necessarily that it's all needs to be kept up with, but it's just, it's getting back to the noise concept, there's a lot more noise we have to work through. Um, so this was multi-center, randomized. Um, the study was in France, uh, placebo-controlled. They also, mostly women, but had men in the study. Um, and they used a one milligram tablet, three minutes, suck, uh, you know, suck on it, swish around, three times a day um, for 14 days. And they also did the visual analog scale. And they looked at the mean reduction. And there was a greater mean reduction in the clomazepam group than in the placebo group. Um, one, so interestingly, if you look at the, um, at the study flow, the left side is clonazepam, right side is control. Two discontinued because of side effects in clonazepam, and one discontinued because of side effects in placebo. So it really shows you how amazing it is. Because that's statistically insignificant, right? Regardless of the class of the study. Two versus one, it's the same. You have the exact same side effects. And you, just, you have to love that. It's, it's, it tells you so much about the patients that we see. And um, here is, here is um, the response data. So they, they separated out into sort of like trying to identify why some, why, what, which groups responded better than others. Um, and, um, and you can see in the, the figure with the blood concentration, the therapeutic level is noted above. So any of these patients who had, um, the, who had detectable blood levels, it was all well below. Now that doesn't mean that that is totally sub-therapeutic systemically, right? So that's, and it, that's the, the therapeutic concentration would be across the population. And we know that there's variability. You know, I've never taken clonazepam. I've had midazolam, so I mean, my, my body's been exposed to it, but maybe if I were at a, a, a concentration of 16.5, I would even understand where that now. I, mean, I, don't, you know, I don't know. So, you know, I think we always have to accept that even from a topical treatment, there may be a, a systemic effect, even if we're not getting it at the same level that we sort of would anticipate being the drug uh, systemically. And um, side effects. Um, so in topical clonazepam versus placebo, so these weren't necessarily discontinuation, just side effects reported. Um, so interestingly, so drowsiness, exactly the same, four and three. Um, an increase in burning, exactly the same, two and two. Dry mouth symptom, one patient using topical clonazepam, um, and the others are you know, not really. Even. So one patient noting the form of behavior, but again, it's one versus zero. Um, everybody had a consent, you know, it wasn't even just, they could read about the potential side effects of the medication. They actually have a research consent form, which certainly would have talked about, you know, risk of systemic effects. Here are the common systemic effects of the so, um, Another more recent study looking at um, response to topical clonazepam and burning mouth, also double blind, placebo controlled, 
um, looking at VAS at one month and then six months after starting treatment. They used a half milligram tablet, suck and swish for three minutes again. Could be used up to, but can't exceed four times a day. Um, they did a safety visit after one week. Um, five patients reported some, uh, some sleepiness. All the clinics have had group, but they didn't make a change in the regimen and they ended up being okay. It was only after one week. Um, after one month, they found um, in the clinics of hand group greater than 50, at least 50%, if not greater than, reduction in a significant proportion 23 out of 33. In the placebo group, only 4 out of 33. Um, and interestingly, there were five cures in the clinics of hand group and one in the placebo group. I mean, you read these studies, and I think they're interesting when you first read them. They're interesting, you know, for all of you who don't have as much experience yet. But honestly, reading these papers after like years and years of treating patients is—it's really like it really opens your eyes. It makes you think a lot about like what you're doing when you're treating patients. Um, so they know, nevertheless, the rapid reduction of discomfort. Less than 10 minutes in the duration of the period in which the patient is asymptomatic, typically three to five hours, are not consistent with data on the pharmacokinetic properties of systemic clonazepam. When administered orally, clonazepam has a half life of 25 to 60 hours, a serum peak between three and 12 hours due to its hepatic dilution. Normally, it takes three to four hours to exert its pharmacological effects, which last 78 hours. So it's really interesting, right? So you're saying, at least what we're seeing, even if all the patients are making it up, it seems to follow a very different pattern than would otherwise be expected if this was acting systemically. Um, and then they say our personal experience has shown us that if we manage to calm the patient with our attitude, the possibility of improvement increases. This is particularly true in patients who are relatively stable from an emotional point of view. You have to love when the authors are willing to put this in the paper because they just, I mean, it's our personal experience. We didn't study this. There's no way that we, we always said, we, all the studies that we think about doing in burning well, you somehow, like, if you want to control for that aspect of it, you almost undermine the design of the study because you're going to make it that much more difficult to demonstrate whatever it is you're trying to demonstrate. And you just have to accept the fact that it's also going to be more effective on the placebo side. Fixing <laughs> something. Um, another study, um, this was combined topical systemic clonazepam, retrospective single setter. Um, more females than males again, but with males. Um, clonazepam, 0 0.5 milligrams dissolved in the mouth, but then swallowed. Um, and could be increased variably up to three times a day over a three weeks sort of ramp up period. Um, and median was, with a mean of 1.5 milligrams, but ranging anywhere from 0.5 to 2.25. Um, and again, pretty similar design, just going to ask symptoms at one, three, and six months. Um, response, so 50% would be noted as partial or marked response. They had a partial in 16.7%. Um, a marked response, so greater in 50%. And complete response reported in, uh, in 12, 33%. They had side effects in um, 12 individuals, so a significant number. And one of them was considered severe, and they were as served as expected. You know, drowsiness, dizziness, mood changes, Forgetful, all things that would be expected in the clinics of him. Um, so, again, retrospective, um, but another another study demonstrating some evidence base here. So, I'm going to show our data also, which is just, which is retrospective, so not the highest level. Um, but we took a somewhat different approach, and this is still remains the approach that I use when I'm treating patients with topical um, clinics of him. I'm just I'm not convinced that it's safe to give someone a tablet to suck on, but ask them not to swallow their saliva. Because 
instinctually, this, it's not something that we typically do. So even if you prescribe clotrimazole atrocious for your patient, they're swallowing the saliva, right? Like, you're using it topically. Someone gives you a, a mint, you know? Like, you suck on it, maybe. You don't usually, like, let your saliva go up. Use that term like a mouth wash, right? No, you just you suck on the mouth and you swallow your saliva. Um, and so, I, again, I try and think like, practically about things and think about like, why is it that you would be more less likely to do something or follow the instruction. To me, sucking on a tablet is like sucking on a lollipop. It's okay, it's just noise. It's like sucking on a lollipop. A lollipop, like I don't know, a two year old that starts learning how to use a lollipop at like, two, three years old. I mean, what? It's safe? Three? Two? Three? I don't know. You guys have kids. Four? Three? Four years old? I mean, really young, right? And you know what to do. It's like, okay, I'm going to suck on it, I'm going to enjoy the flavor, and I'm going to swallow it. Um, for a rinse, what's the likelihood that you ask somebody to rinse with something? But they accidentally swallow it. Especially if it maybe doesn't even taste great. And again, I think at a very young age, most children learn, like, I want you to swish this and spit out, like, like a, I don't know, a fluoride rinse or a mouthwash or something. You know? Every once in a while, does somebody swallow by accident? Maybe. But it's not like a natural instinct, like, I want to swallow this, but I've been told to swish and spit. So, that is, has been my rationale for why I don't think that just giving the tablets, which is, it's easier than compounding, it's definitely easier. Um, and more patients have access to tablets just because of how insurance works than being able to access a compounded solution. But I do have patients that will home compound, so we actually use tablets and create a solution at home rather than having them just suck on the tablet. So um, this was retrospective data um, from our center. We, um, but we did what was called a quasi-randomized um, retrospective study design because we changed our, um, we changed the concentration that we used over a period of time because we realized that we probably were using a little bit too much when we got started. Um, and so we had many more patients than this who were treated during this period, but when we actually applied our inclusion and exclusion criteria so that we could actually like, put together a clean um, analysis, we had 26 patients from the first period who were receiving the 0.5 milligram concentration. And we had 32 patients who subsequently were on the 0.1 milligram. So the idea with that is, is if we a standard 5 ml solution rinse, like I want someone to, to rinse with dexamethasone, we usually say 5 ml. It's a standard amount to have in the mouth. Um, 5 ml of 0 0.5 milligram per ml is 2.5 milligrams. So if somebody were to rinse with that and either swallow it by accident or just because of you know their own susceptibility, really absorb most, if not all, of the medication. It would be a 2.5 milligram dose. There's very few people for even severe anxiety that take more than two and a half, three milligrams of clonazepam a day. I mean, I, I have some patients I've seen where they're like two milligrams twice a day, something like that. But I mean, your, your typical patient who's being treated with clinical diagnosis of anxiety will be on 0 0.5 milligrams once a day, twice a day, maybe three times a day. Um, which would still be a significantly lower dose than that total dose. Um, it's 0 0.1 milligrams in a 5 ml solution. It's 0 0.5 milligrams, which is the standard dose. So at least from a safety standpoint, especially if somebody's not gonna swallow it, you'd argue, okay, like, in theory, this should be safer. Um, we, we had VAS scores, again, just because it's, it's what we used in our clinic. We also looked at percentage improvements or global response questions. Um, and there were results. We had follow-up at uh, seven weeks after starting anywhere. Um, we had ranges of follow-up ranging from three weeks all the way to longer term of 
five months. Um, at the 0 0.5 concentration, there were 92% that reported greater than 50% improvement. At the 0 0.1, we had 41% that reported greater than 50% improvement. Adverse events in total um, affected about 15%. And in the lower concentration, we had five. And in the higher concentration, we had four. And they're basically the same. Uh, there were two that discontinued, three dose reductions um, from the 0 0.5 dose. So again, this is all retrospective. This doesn't include everybody who was treated. So even from the standpoint of safety, we have, I could look at safety data, but patients who maybe didn't have a BAS score, so they weren't included. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's an interesting analysis in that it seems like perhaps you will get a greater likelihood of a response if you go with a higher dose. Um, I'm worried about safety. Our data, at least in this study, doesn't really show that it's a whole lot less or more safe than a higher or lower concentration. But at least things that I consider when I'm, and I always start a patient at 0 0.1 milligrams. I end up a little higher, uh, but I do have some that I sort of look through a, a, a gradation of 0 0.1. 0.25 versus 0.5. And again, um, just you know, the, table, the, the upper table looking at a comparison of the percentage of symptomatic improvement based on the um, concentration. And you can see uh, 30%. Um, 32% 30, in um, the 0 0.1 and up to 75% in the 0 0.5. Um, again, I, I think from a safety standpoint, I'm still convinced that even if it may be more effective, um, I'll still leave on the placebo aspect of things enough that I'm always going to start at the 0.1. I feel like it's a much safer, even if even from the standpoint of somebody just following instructions carefully. Um, and also, and again, um, the um, you know the differences we were able to demonstrate between the 0 0.1 and 0 0.5 milligram uh, cohorts related to um, worst MRI, worst um, uh, zero to ten pain score, and um, the percentage. Of Also, um, look specifically at safety and tolerability in, our, in another analysis. Again, so in this case, we could have much greater numbers because we weren't looking at the efficacy aspect of things. So it didn't really matter, like, you know, were we treating a patient and they had burning? We were asking, did your burning get better, which we did for the other study. In this case, it may have been, you know, swelling, but we excluded those patients. Um, they may not have had the exact same follow-up to where we could, res we could assess the response, but from a safety standpoint, we took all comers. So in this case, we have 78 patients who were treated at 0 0.5 and 84 at 0.1. 23% um, with adverse events at the initial follow-up, which is typically four weeks, maybe four to eight weeks. And I just don't remember 23% um, versus 15.5% here. Um, we, we did dose adjustments in 6%. Treatment was discontinued in 8%. So 15% had either a dose, adjust, dose adjustment or, um, or it's discontinuation because of this. And um, there wasn't a significant difference in those between, um, you know, between the higher and lower concentration, like we saw in the other study. The other analysis because again, I don't really want to call another study. These are some of these are the same patients, of course. Um, 
interestingly, there were two motor vehicle accidents reported. Um, they were both at the higher concentration, 0.5. One occurred after only using one time, one occurred after seven times. And interestingly, I mean, there was only one that had a tox, a tox screen, like a blood test screen, because something happened and they worked for a, muni a municipality. So it was something like it was like a standard, you know, do a test, and they were negative. So I don't actually know what to make of this, but I'll be honest that it was these two situations that made me take a step back and change my approach to the zero because it just really worried me that something like this could happen with 0.5 milligrams. Concentration. So, what about placebo response? And I think this is some of the most interesting work that I've ever been involved in. Uh, this was uh, thesis research with one of our prior, um, one of our previous uh, really brilliant oral medicine attorneys, um, we call it short. And we worked with somebody who has expertise in placebo science. Um, Steve Sotis was involved with this. This was really, really interesting work. And we looked at all of the placebo-controlled trials um, for um, all the placebo-controlled trials in burning off syndrome and looked at the response difference in placebo versus, um, you know, versus active treatment. And the takeaway, as you can see here in the bottom of the bowl, is that on average, treatment with placebos produced a response that was 72% as large as the response to active drugs. It's amazing. So if you remember any of you of my talk for the, the head neck oncology talk two days ago, um, we talk about how there's better salivary gland function with IMRT compared to pre-IMRT radiation techniques. But if you're the patient receiving IMRT today and you have dry mouth symptoms afterwards, does that, if, if someone were to give you that study, would it make you feel better or worse about your symptoms? I don't know. I mean, it's just telling you that if you were treated 25 years ago, However you feel right now, you probably feel a little bit worse. So when I take something like this, it's like magic. Because, I mean, does somebody know what a 72% response is versus an 84% sort of of the ability to respond means? For some people, if they just had a 30% response, it might be like, oh, God does exist, right? And you don't even need to get to 70%. So, I mean, I don't mean to make light of, of course, of that, but it's just, it's amazing. I would say it's amazing. And it also opens up our eyes, because it means every time we treat a patient, we don't know how and why they're responding. And if it's truly a response to, you know, medication, getting into tissue, interacting with a receptor, leading to a change, a change, a change, a change, something like that. Versus, I can't wait to get better from this. Before I'm going to my mouth, that whole sequence of events has already happened. Because the same thing is happening. Um, I think for time, I'm always going to be trying to go through this table of files in detail. Look at the paper. The most important thing It's a really, really interesting, I think, really important paper for the field. Um, and then, again, I'm not an expert in placebo science. Fortunately, we have experts um, in the Harvard Medical System, and that's actually how we got um, Dr. Kelly involved with us, because um, he works very closely with um, with this um, with this individual, Ted Tapchik, who's done from best of my understanding, like some of the most important placebo science research like in the world through his career. 
um, he's a really interesting person to listen to. Uh, to talk here, talk here. I'll find him on YouTube. Really interesting. Yeah. 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 Like a really calm, down to earth person. Not somebody who's kind of like, oh, I have, you know, I'm going to like break the system and be crazy. It's just, just trying to move the science forward. Um, <clears throat> This is a this is a, a great paper on um, placebos and chronic pain, evidence theory, ethics, and use in clinical practice. We talk about some of the some of the important definitions of what is a placebo, what's a placebo treatment, and so on. Um, I would just you know really really recommend that you read any of these references you see here, or others that you find might be interesting. Um, and then, interestingly, another study that was done. Um, twenty twelve, or I think 20 something, sometime in the twenty tens. Um, cost effectiveness analysis of burning low syndrome therapy. Now, of course, there's going to be a tremendous amount of bias in even you know, what like. What was their inclusion criteria, what's been published, and so on. But with that being said, um, topical clonazepam actually was at the top of the, their list from a cost effectiveness standpoint, meaning both cost and effectiveness, of course. And then I throw this out here really quickly because I would argue that this is much more relevant for, um, for more of the like atypical upper intelligent, atypical facial pain. Patients we see, but I do have some where again, if the symptoms are in a really limited um, distribution, that something like these neuro um, um, neurosensory appliances that we've reported on, and I've had amazing responses. Not a huge number of patients, but you know, continuing growing number of patients throughout my career um, can be effective. And interestingly, and it's not very well described in the literature. But some of my colleagues will um, use this approach. You, you know, just having an occlusive stent, like over the, the hard palate, even if the palate isn't the primary site of burning, just that kind of like comforting glove effect, so to speak, can actually um, give patients good uh, good relief from their symptoms. I don't have so much experience with that with trying that, um, but you know, I think there's a lot of ways to make patients better. And if you haven't read this paper, read this paper. There's some really, really cool cases in here. So, as usual, we covered a lot of ground in a relatively short amount of time. Um, hopefully I was as honest as possible about what I really know here, what I think I know, what I don't know, areas that I have expertise, less expertise, so don't challenge me on too many questions. Um, but I think oral dysesthesia, it's a really complicated neuropathic medical condition. So, you know, you go back to like those papers I showed you from 1970, and it's kind of dismissive, and the patient's, you know, crazy, and, but, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna replace the filling material on this tooth with one thing and this on the other one, because my understanding is that, you know, I mean, we've come a long way from there. And this is a recognized sort of classified condition, maybe maybe too classified in some ways. Um, but you know, these are patients who like they come to the clinic, they use resources, they use a lot of resources, they take a lot of time, um, they require long-term management, oftentimes over years, if not decades. Um, so I mean, this is a real medical condition. There is a rationale. I'm not going to say that it's the best treatment. I'm not even going to say that it's better than placebo in most cases, or all cases. But there's at least a rationale for the use of both systemic and topical clonazepam. There's some biological basis. There's a pathophysiological basis. There's some evidence base from clinical trials. Um, on the, on, at, at, at the same time, placebo response is very real. And I would argue that it can and should be leverage, not in the setting of a clinical trial, but in the setting of clinical care. I tell every one of my patients about that paper. And I say, you know, use it to your advantage. I don't know how or why you're going to get better. I just want you to get better. 
think positively, expect you're going to get better. Don't expect you're going to have problems with the treatment, you know, because we know all these things will lead to problems. Um, and like other things we've talked about so far since I've been here, um, there's huge amounts of opportunity for research. And I would just, is it, like in any situation, think about what research is needed versus maybe it's not so important. Um, but I think there's a lot of huge amount of opportunity here. So stop there, we can discuss, we can talk about whatever, whatever Dr. Leidens wants us to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for any of you who uh, were on the YouTube yeah. Zoom. Yeah. We're really tired. Yeah. Thank you, Nate, for this amazing lecture. Another one. We have the pleasure to to hear from you in the, this last week, and for us, it's been amazing. Question. That for the audience is better that you speak in the Thanks for a lecture. Um, I would like to know how often do you use data when you prescribe data? And when you prescribe, do you, well, do you let me first question is how often do I prescribe? Do I prescribe what? You got a pentan. You got a pentan versus a you mean? Actually, more GABA because in our service, when we prescribe GABA, our, patient, our patients report to be very sleepy and dizzy, and they stop using the medications. You, but it, when you say GABA, you mean GABA Penta? Yes. yes. GABA Penta? Yes. Okay. Um, so it's a good question for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, GABA Penta, in theory, should also be able to be used topically, like clonazepam. And it's available commercially in a solution form because it's such a commonly used medication. For example, children who need to take it who can't swallow pills, you know, we have it available in a solution, probably here also. Clonazepam is not. Clonazepam has to be compounded. Um, this is anecdote. I don't have data to, to tell you this, but anecdotally, I have not seen a very good response to topical gabapentin compared with topical clonazepam. Does it mean that I have not had patients respond? Of course not. Um, so I use it sometimes, but it's I don't use it that often. For systemic gabapentin, systemic gabapentin can be effective, but I think okay, there are situations where I would use gabapentin in a patient with oral dissociation. It wouldn't be my first choice treatment, topical or systemic. Um, but what I would say is when you use gabapentin systemically, things you have to be aware of is it has a huge therapeutic range, a huge, right? Some patients, they take it 100 milligrams a day, and for whatever they're taking it for, it works really, really, well, and they're not taking it for no reason at all. And some patients take it in 2700 milligrams a day, or even 3600 milligrams a day. So it's, it's like it's like apples and oranges. Some patients, they take 100 milligrams the first time, and it's like the world is ending, you know? Like, it's like they, it's like they had, you know, way too many cachasas and cervezas <laughs> and whatever. And, and it's like, and other patients take 3,600 milligrams a day and it's like, they're just as totally comfortable, no side effects, nothing. And it's, and it's helping their condition. So there's a lot of variability, a lot of variability in how people tolerate the medication, but how you actually prescribe it I think is as important than prescribing gabapentin. And for example, if your if your starting dose is you're thinking, you know, I'd like you to, to try to get up to 300 milligrams three times a day to a 900 milligram a day dose, which is very standard. Doesn't mean that everybody needs it, you know. 
And a lot of patients are just treated, especially by a primary care physician. They're just given 100 milligrams at night dose. It's kind of like a standard gabapentin dose, it seems like, but it's not the way the gabapentin is really intended to be prescribed. Um, what I have patients do, that's a really long answer to your question, but this is the kind of time that I spend when I'm prescribing gabapentin to a patient, is you take 100 milligrams the first night, you just, and I always say, see how you feel tomorrow. And I always, I say, I don't care how you feel, like your condition, I want to know how you feel in your head. You get up in the morning, you feel fine, you don't feel dizzy, confused, like anything, then take the morning dose also. But if you feel even a little bit off, don't take the morning dose, don't take the midday dose, just take the nighttime dose again. See how you feel the next morning. Maybe it takes you two days, maybe it takes you a week. I don't really care. You need to get to the point that you just don't feel like you're taking medication, then take the morning dose. If the first day they tolerated it, they can take the morning dose. So can you imagine like that stepwise approach? It means that for one patient, in three days, they may be up to taking 300 milligrams. Three, they, in three days, they may be taking 100 milligrams three times a day. In three or four, five, six days, within a week, they can be taking 300 three times a day. Another patient, it could take them a month and a half to get to that point. But it's not a race. Like, you're trying to get to a therapeutic benefit. Um, and I tell patients, like, 300 three times a day is, a, is my target. But if at 100 milligrams, you're a lot better, and you don't think you need to take more, you don't need to keep going up. Or you get to 100 three times a day, and it's like you're doing really well, you don't need to go to 200. So I explain all that. But for somebody who's, who, who follows like a regimen, like, oh, I'm going to give you a Medrol dose pack, right? You're going to take this many pills the first day, you're going to take four the next day, you're going to take three the next day, two the next day, one, and then you'll be better. If you take that approach with gabapentin, you're going to have many patients who have bad side effects and will tell you that they can't tolerate the medication and they're not willing to try it again. I guarantee, I mean, this, is, I, 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 this is all from experience. So it's a, long, it's a long answer to a really good question. And I don't want to challenge you now to think about, like, well, tell me more about each one of those patients. But my guess would be is some of them took too much too quickly or didn't take enough time letting the side effects sort of go away. Thank you, Dan. Very nice to hear from you about your experience. And um, as we mentioned, as I mentioned to you before, a lot of people that like so much to treat this type of patient. And as we are here in our YouTube, I usually invite other colleagues your, your to treat friends. this patient. Your my friends. friends. Especially my husband, so it's easy for me to talk about because I don't manage this patient. Um, but uh, listen, your experience for us is very important, especially to to think. I think that uh, uh, with oral life implants, sometimes I try to follow the same step, start with the topical, and then think about the systemic and think about the dose in the same in the same rationale. So. For me, it was amazing to follow all the information that you discussed with us today, especially this, this experience that you have with topical and sustainable medications. I have just a question. Um, I read one of the papers that you sent to us. Uh, I think that was Camille that published for us from Australia, he used the combination of topical and yeah, systemic. Yeah. What do you think about that? I, I don't like the approach. And I've had debates with some of my faculty members because some have asked patients to use the topical in that way. So rather than if you're going to combine a topical and systemic approach, actually have the topical then become your systemic. Um, I don't like the approach because I just it just feels messy to me. You know, it's like you're trying to do too many things with one way. So, and also you don't really know, like, are, are you gonna? How, how do you know what the effect is if you're doing both, especially from the start? But I would argue that even if I'm gonna have somebody 
do a topical and systemic. So let's say um, their topical regimen is three times a day rinsing. And then, what's that? 0.1. Sure, let's say 0 0.1 milligram solution. Um, and then the, the systemic regimen is they take um, 0 0.25 milligrams at night or 0 0.5 or in the morning, whatever, I'm just making it up. But it's three topical a day, one systemic. And the volume that the t is normally being used topically is not the systemic dose. To me, you're setting up a situation where you're asking for somebody to start doing something different from what you expected or to make a mistake versus you have two different treatments. So here's one. Here's the other. You use this one in one way this many times a day, and you use this one in a specific way once a day. It kind of gets back to, you know, like the kid in the lollipop. I just, mm -hmm. I try and think like basic human behavior and how people think. And generally, even though we think people are pretty smart, how sort of stupid and careless they are, you know? Thank you. Yeah, Robert. Hey, thank you for an excellent lecture again. Uh, I have a question. question. Uh, do you have any experience with Aristabi? The name of the drug is Aripiprazole. What is it? Aripiprazole. How do you spell? Mm. What is it? What's the what's what's the target? What's the mechanism? I don't know. It's a drug that the the people of the the medicine the medicine the medical group that treat pain here in our hospital uh, they use this kind of drug to to mm -hmm. manage the central pain is it an ssri or an snri can i see what it is no no, no, no it is not another question another i will question. check okay. and i will send i will okay. show to you let's do, do if, another. if it's an if it's an ssri or snri I, I don't prescribe those at all. Mm -hmm. I just, it's, I, I've never let them sort of enter into my comfort zone of prescribing medications. And so there may be some patients that I just, you know, I, I can't address as effectively, but I, I haven't gotten um, overly experimental, you know, with all of the other potential medications that are being used to treat aspects of chronic pain. Janet is here. Um, Yep. Uh, just saying, burning mouth syndrome is a challenge. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Bruna saw a uh, question. I understand that it's a very complex condition. It can be quite frustrating for both patient and professional. In suspicions of a psychological underlying condition, how we respectfully approach patients without stigmatizing them, avoiding unwarranted assumption about their mental health. How do you do this? How do you approach your patients? So this is for a patient who, who has a known psycho yes, psychiatric yes, diagnosis? Yes, and, and then you are feeling that yeah. the patient has? Um, honestly, I think with medicine, the relationship between the doctor and the patient is really important. And if you've taken the time in obtaining a really good history, learning about that aspect of their history, learning about how it's affected them, how they've managed it, how it's affected aspects of their life. Um, and it gets to the point where, you know, they just, they trust you. I haven't found that it, it's ever awkward or uncomfortable. You know, it's like, it's just, it's, it's, it's acknowledged. Um, I think more often than not, I mean, even patients just, they really, really respect and appreciate um, the time we take, the understanding, the explanation, um, but also for them feeling like, oh, you know, this is somebody who actually knows what I have, they have experience with it, um, and they're willing to listen to me, take time, and they want to help me, you know, feel better. So I think as long as you like, you can check all those things off the box. Nobody's ever going to feel stigmatized. And I, I believe 
that this trust that you are talking about, that the patient needs to trust you, and if you explain what we know about this situation, about the disease, maybe the placebo effect can occur? There's no question. There's no question. I would say not even that. Not even that, but I've had many patients where, you know, they will report from that initial visit, by the end of the visit, that if their pain, like they came in and their tongue was at a 10, that it's like, it's down to like a two, just from the visit. And it's, but it's because it's just, there's so much anxiety, uncertainty, you know, confusion, noise, so you help kind of control it. Any other questions, girls? Uh, microphone to the fourth row. The fourth fourth row needs to come here. <laughs> um, I have two or three patients with this condition, and those are associated with depression. In your experience, this is coming from. Yeah, I mean, you saw it. Remember? I, mean, I didn't know. Some of that early, early um, identified from uh, from validated, you know, um, questionnaires assessing for anxiety and depression that there's significant, you know, significant increase in patients with this diagnosis. So it's just you just have to acknowledge it. It doesn't mean that it causes it. It doesn't mean that it causes it. Not. It doesn't mean that everybody who has anxiety or depression is susceptible to health in this condition. And it also doesn't mean that everybody with this condition, even if they don't have anxiety and depression, like, sort of have. It's just, there's all these different buckets. So, but yes, but, but some patients will. And probably there are, those patients are a little bit more difficult to manage. A little bit more. This is a lot more. So we talked about this. <laughs> yeah. And I, I but I have many patients like that. So many patients like that. But then we add a topical on top. Or, you know, really, really lean really on. So you know, I didn't use this lecture to talk about management mm -hmm. of oral dysesthesia. There isn't a single patient who's using topical clonazepam who isn't also chewing gum or doing something like that. You know? And for many patients, that's all they need. But for you to explain that, but not explain it like it's dismissive, but to explain it with like some science behind it, then it becomes like, oh, like they're empowered and they're like, oh, great, like I can just not chew gum. How amazing is it that chewing gum is 100% effective for so many of these patients? Right? It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, so in your do you use any uh, anxiety questionnaire with these patients like backline? No. It's just, I hate to say it, but you know, for research purposes, wonderful. Just like using various diagnostic criteria mm -hmm. really, really, really specifically. Um, from a practical, pragmatic standpoint, in a really high volume, fast paced clinic, I mean, you could have instruments that you ask them to complete beforehand, but then, like, what do you? I'm just going to ask the patient, you know what I mean? Or, it, or it's already on their, already within their you know, electronic health record system, anxiety, depression, okay, see the medications they're taking, maybe ask a little bit like, you know, stable, not stable, like how many years, you know, some basic questions, but I don't get too deep into it. I totally understand. <laughs> Any other question? Thank you for another great lecture. Uh, I don't have a great expertise on treating these patients, but the patients I have treated, I can tell that we have never achieved a complete response with any treatment. And I was wondering, uh, listening to your lecture, what, when do you consider that you have achieved like a 
successful response. If a patient taking the I can tell you, I'll tell you specifically. Very so for any patient, mm -hmm. for almost any condition, I'm not gonna say this is the best response mm -hmm. you can get, but from the standpoint of I will consider that I've done my job. I, I hope I can do my job better, but at least I've done my job. Fifty percent of benchmark, and for especially for pain symptom based you know diagnoses, that's pretty standard in the literature. So you set that as a bar. It's like someone says, and that's why I like to ask the global response. I don't want to try to play a game. Oh, you gave me a score of this. Now you gave me a score of this. But when I calculate the difference, it's, no, I just say, okay, you came back a month later. You know how you felt when you were here. Like, would you say it's like, and, and I think the key is like, you never want to lead somebody, but you want to like explain to them what you're trying to get to. So I'll, I'll always like, I'll never start with what I want them to say. I don't want them to say anything, of course, but I kind of want to hear something positive. Um, you, know, I'm like, you know, so um, overall, from the first time you came to see me, would you say it's like, you know, 1% better? 100% better, 50%, you know, so I just kind of like throw these like, and then they're like, oh, at least 60. So like when you gave the 50, they're like, no, 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 it's not 50, it's better than 50. Well, if they're gonna say better than 50, you've already like exceeded your expectations. When they give 40, it's like, maybe this person's a little bit glass half empty, right? <laughs> so they're, they're kind of giving me a 50, but they're not quite willing to say it's 50 yet. <laughs> When someone says 15 to 20, it's like, it's placebo response. It's placebo. Like, I don't think, I don't, maybe they're getting a 20% response from the treatment, but I don't know, I just, I just assume placebo. But then, you know, maybe they're only doing it, they were only doing it once a day. And they even will encourage themselves. But maybe can I do it more? Like, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Let's, let's try going to three times a day. But if you come back one month later, Reporting, reporting 50% of the program, that's great. Would you try to increase the dosage? It or? depends on the patient. Because, again, some patients would be like, that's all I was asking for. Thank you. Like, you, you made my life better. And others will, you know, it's like you give a little bit and they want more. So, it's, it's, it's variable. And also, it has happened, happened to patients they report a great response in the beginning, and then it's after a few months, longer. yeah, that's it, classic for placebo. Classic for placebo. So after yeah, a few initial, months, because you're because you're you know you're you're positive, you're anticipating, you're expecting, but the placebo for some people it can only last for so long. And then it's the time to change the, the approach to treatment. In the case. Possibly, yeah. possibly, um, but at least with topical clonazepam. I have the, without side effects, I have the opportunity and an extra placebo mm -hmm. to increase the percentage, the, the concentration. And if, if the patient is Because that's a placebo in itself, yes. right? Okay. So when you start to more concentration, you go to a different concentration, like changing it, going to something that's going to be likely to be more effective, has all sorts of placebo mm -hmm. like, language to it. And have you had about patients uh, doing this popcorn? Years, years, years. I have, I, have, I have some patients that have been using for, um, yeah, 15 years. Well, yeah, and with, with good response. Actually, I had one. I just saw a um, virtual follow-up patient I've been treating for almost like almost 15 years. Um, a few times would try to stop. Interestingly, she was treating more of like almost like an atypical facial pain type symptom. So, so she developed in the context of her cancer therapy, and amazing response, would try stopping, symptoms would come back, so she stayed on it, and then decided she wanted to try this really long, slow taper mm -hmm. off of the medication to see if like, her body would just let her, like, maybe it just, and maybe it's just that she was gonna get better at that point, you know? Because she started cutting back, mm -hmm. and the symptoms didn't uh, recur, and then when I saw her for her follow-up, she had, you know, completely stopped, and then we decided, okay, I don't need to see her anymore. After seeing her for like 15 years, you know, patients who I, 
you know all the stories where children growing up and everything. It's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. So that. thank you. So so another thing that I didn't you know emphasize because again the purpose of this talk wasn't um, management per se was not just the non-pharmacologic management approaches but other potential pharmacologic. So for example, in our patient information sheet for these patients, we talk about the use of, um, of capsaicin. Mm -hmm. So there's some science behind it. My experience has been most patients will not tolerate it and most patients don't get better from it. And so I try not to be too much biased, but again, it's like, do I want to stick a needle in my patient's mm -hmm. tongue the first time I see them? Do I want to give them something that's going to hurt to start? Um, but some patients absolutely do respond. Like, there's no question. Um, and one of my colleagues, Herve Susi, has such a grateful patient that he treated with topical uh, capsaicin that they painted a picture for him. Wow. <laughs> of, like a beautiful uh, Tabasco like truck, like delivering the Tabasco sauce, you know, in like the Mexican countryside or something. <laughs> So for all the patients I've successfully treated with clonazepam, nobody's ever painted me a picture. <laughs> and, then, and then also, you know, alpha lipoic acid. Like, there are many, you saw the placebo studies, you know, many people use it. I, I just, I don't, I, like the data, I don't, the data is not as good as the clonazepam data. I'm not a data specialist. But it's just, it's not as good. The studies aren't as good. And I just, from a, um, from a mechanism standpoint, from a sort of like kinetics of response and treatment standpoint, I just don't really buy it. Um, I'm not, especially if a patient asks me about it, I'm very supportive. Um, and I don't dismiss it to saying like, it will be a placebo. Um, but again, from a practical standpoint and trying to manage patients as effectively effectively as I can, I don't really consider it part of my, you know, regimen. But, you know, it has to be considered if you think about, like, the evidence base for managing oral disassociation. Here we have the information. Mm -hmm. In U.S., the name is Abdelwifi. Okay, that's used to... Uh, it's antipsychotic. Uh, yeah, so I would never yeah. touch that medication. Okay. When you read the side effect profile of the antipsychotics, I, I wouldn't touch it. Yeah. Any questions? So, Matt, thank you so much again. I think that for this morning, we are we are done. Thank you so right. much. At even afternoon, we have other meeting, but in local, okay. just local meeting. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I think that here we have a meeting in next Monday morning with the group of the medicine. The Roman Power group okay. no. together, but everybody is invited. So thank you so much again. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Now, after your talk, I think that I like a little bit more about it. <laughs> the patients don't change. You know? Yes. Yeah. And I still have the Michael with me. So. <laughs> yeah, very true, very true. Thank you very much. Man. Thank you, guys. Hope you find it interesting. Yeah. It's, it's very it's, nice. It's, it's fun putting a lecture together. There's just there's so many different stories you can tell.